As the golden rays of the sun illuminate the banks of the Nile, we are transported back in time to an era of unparalleled grandeur and majesty. It is here, amidst the fertile valleys of Egypt, that the story of Ramesses VI begins. Born into the illustrious lineage of the Ramesside dynasty, Ramesses VI emerged as a beacon of hope amidst the shifting sands of dynastic politics. His ascent to the throne marked a new chapter in Egypt's storied history, a chapter defined by ambition, intrigue, and the relentless pursuit of power. From the moment of his coronation, Ramesses VI faced the weight of expectation, tasked with leading a kingdom on the cusp of greatness. But amidst the splendor of his surroundings, Ramesses VI remained keenly aware of the challenges that lay ahead. Forged in the crucible of dynastic rivalry, he would need to navigate treacherous waters to secure his place in history. Ramesses VI was a son of Ramesses III, the latter being considered the last great pharaoh of the New Kingdom period. This filiation is established beyond doubt by a large relief found in the portico of the Medinet Habu Temple of Ramesses III known as the Procession of the Princes. The relief shows ten princes including Ramesses VI, worshipping their father. Ramesses III sculptors seem to have left the relief incomplete, only the figures of the king and princes appear and no names are written in the spaces next to them. The relief seems to have originally been executed when Ramesses VI was still a young prince, as he is shown wearing the side lock of youth used to denote childhood. When Ramesses VI became king, he added his princely names, Ramesses Amun Herkupchef, inside royal cartouches as well as the titles he held before ascending the throne as, King's Son of His Body, His Beloved, Crown Prince, Royal Scribe, and, Cavalry General. He altered his youthful figure on the procession of the princes, with an Urias underscoring his royal status and further completed the relief with the names of all his brothers and sons, with the exception of Ramesses IV, who had already written his royal name on the relief. Ramesses VI was born into a lineage steeped in royal prestige and divine favor. From his earliest days, he was groomed for greatness, destined to inherit the mantle of leadership that had been passed down through generations. Under the watchful eyes of his tutors and mentors, young Ramesses learned the arts of statecraft and governance, preparing himself for the weighty responsibilities that awaited him. Ramesses' sixth great royal wife was Queen Nubkesp. The Egyptologists believe that she bore Ramesses six a total of four children, the princes Amenhotepshef, Panabenkhamet, and Ramesses Itamen, the future pharaoh Ramesses VII who succeeded his father for a short while on the throne, and Princess Iset who was appointed to the priestly role of divine adoratress of Ammonius. A stela recounting this appointment was discovered in Koptos and demonstrates that Nubkesb was indeed Iset's mother. Prince Amenhotepshef died before his father and was buried in tomb KV-13 in the Valley of the Kings, originally built for Chancellor Bey, an important official of the late 19th dynasty. The tomb decoration was updated in consequence, some reliefs notably mentioning Nubkesb. Amenhotepshef's sarcophagus was usurped from Queen Tuzret. As the years passed, the kingdom flourished under the rule of Ramesses' six predecessors. Yet, beneath the veneer of prosperity, shadows lurked on the horizon. The death of a pharaoh inevitably brings uncertainty and upheaval, as rival factions vie for power and influence. And so it was that when the time came for Ramesses VI to ascend to the throne, he faced a kingdom teetering on the brink of chaos. Ramesses VI assumed the throne around the interval between year 1 first parade day 25 and year 1 second parade day 11 of his reign when his predecessor Ramesses V died. 
The scholarly consensus is now that Ramesses VI reigned in the mid-12th century BC over a period of eight full years and lived for two months into his brief last regnal year. Amidst the swirling currents of intrigue and ambition, Ramesses VI emerged as a beacon of stability and strength. His accession to the throne heralded a new era of hope and renewal for the people of Egypt. And so began the reign of Ramesses VI, a chapter in Egypt's history that would leave an indelible mark on the sands of time. Immediately after his accession to the throne, Ramesses VI and his court may have visited Thebes on the occasion of the beautiful festival of the valley or the Opet festival, concomitant with the preparations for Ramesses V's burial. Ramesses VI visited the city on at least another occasion during his reign, when he installed his daughter as divine adoratress of Ammonius. The situation in the south of Egypt at the time of Ramesses V.I.'s accession was not entirely stable, as attested by records showing that the workmen of Deir el-Bahari could not work on the king's tomb owing to the presence of the enemy in the vicinity, a situation which occurred over a period of at least 15 days during Ramesses V.I.'s first year on the throne. This enemy was rumored to have pillaged and burned the locality of Pernebit and the chief of the Medje of Thebes, essentially the police, ordered the workmen to remain idle and watch the king's tomb. It is unclear who these enemies were, the term could designate parties of Libyan Meshwesh, Libu and Egyptian bandits, or as the Egyptologist conjectured, a full-blown civil war between followers of Ramesses V and Ramesses VI. A short military campaign might have ensued and from Ramesses VI's second year on the throne onwards these troubles seem to have stopped. This campaign could be connected with an unusual statue of Ramesses VI showing him holding a bound Libyan captive, as well as with a depiction of Ramesses VI triumphing over foreign soldiers on the second pylon of the Karnak temple. This triumph scene was the last one to be made in Egypt until the later reigns of Simon, 986 to 967 BC, and Shoshank the first, 943 to 922 BC. Some indications in favor of strife and military activities early in Ramesses' VI reign are the names he adopted upon ascending the throne, his Horus name meaning, strong bull, great of victories, keeping alive the two lands, as well as his Nedi name, powerful of arms, attacking the myriads. Following these events, on his second year of rule, Ramesses VI finally buried Ramesses V in a yet unidentified tomb in the Valley of the Kings, having usurped the tomb originally prepared for his predecessor. On the occasion of this visit to Thebes, Ramesses VI installed his daughter Iset as God's wife of Ammonius and divine adoratus of Ammonius, in the presence of his mother, the acting vizier Nehei and other court officials. That same year, he ordered the reduction of the gang of workmen working on the king's tomb from 120 members to its former number of 60, which had been changed under Ramesses IV. Following this, the community of workers at Deir el-Medina went into gradual decline, the settlement being finally abandoned in the subsequent 21st dynasty. In spite of the reduction, the Turin Papyrus indicates that Ramesses VI ordered the construction of six tombs in the Valley of the Queens, a number which might include the hasty completion of the tomb of Iset Tahemjer, Ramesses' mother. It is unknown whether these tombs were finished and in any case, they are now unidentifiable. At some point in his reign, a cult statue of Ramesses VI was installed in a shrine of Ramesses II in the Temple of Hathor of Deir el-Medina. The statue was called Lord of the Two Lands, Nebmater Mariamun, Son of Re, Lord of Crowns, Ramesses Amun Herkepshef Divine Ruler of Yunu, Beloved Lycomonius. A complete description of it is given on the verso of the Turin Papyrus map, celebrated for being the oldest surviving topographical map. The papyrus indicates that the statue was made of two essences of painted wood and clay, 
showing Pharaoh wearing a golden loincloth, a crown of lapis lazuli and precious stones, a ureus of gold and sandals of electrum. The statue is said to receive three services of incense and libations every day. The text of the papyrus is a letter directly addressed to Ramesses VI asking that a certain man be put in charge of the offerings. The letter seems to have been received favorably by the king, as the author's grandson is known to have held the title of High Priest of Nebmater, Ramesses VI, beloved of Ammonius. Ramesses VI was apparently fond of such cult statues and no less than ten statues and a sphinx have been discovered in Tanis, Bubastis and Karnak, more than any other Ramesside king of the 20th dynasty following the reign of Ramesses III. The tomb of Pene, an Egyptian high official in Nubia reports that Pene made a donation of lands to generate revenue towards the upkeep of yet another cult statue of Ramesses VI. Ramesses VI was so satisfied with this deed that he commanded his viceroy of Kush give the two silver vessels of ointment of gums to the deputy, Pene. Over the period spanning the reigns of Ramesses VI, VII and VIII, prices of basic commodities, in particular grain, rose sharply, with Egypt's economy getting weaker, Ramesses VI turned to usurping the statues and monuments of his forebears, frequently plastering and then carving his cartouches over theirs, in particular those of Ramesses for which figured prominently along the processional routes in Karnak and Luxor. In other examples, he usurped a statue of Ramesses IV, columns of texts inscribed by Ramesses IV on an obelisk of Thutmose I in Karnak, and the tomb of Ramesses V. Kitchen warns not to overinterpret these usurpations as signs of antagonism on behalf of Ramesses VI with respect to his older brother and nephew. The usurpations were not thorough but were rather targeted to the most prominent places, where Ramesses V.I.'s cartouches would be most visible. Besides, Ramesses VI did leave cartouches of Ramesses IV intact in many places, including in places where both his name and that of his brother feature close to one another such as in the Medinet Habu Temple of Ramesses III, so that the hypothesis of a damnatio memoriae, whereby all references to someone are systematically eliminated so as to remove this person from memory and history, can be eliminated. In Thebes, the high priesthood came under the control of Ramsesnacht and his family at the time of Ramesses IV, possibly owing to Ramsesnacht's father Meribast's high control over the country's financial institutions. Ramsesnacht was officially Ramesses VI's vizier of the south and his power grew at the expense of that of the pharaoh in spite of the fact that Iset was connected to the Ammonius priesthood as well, in her role as God's wife of Ammonius or divine Adoratus. In fact, Ramsesnacht most likely oversaw the construction of the funerary building of Iset in the tomb complex K-93, and while, as the Egyptologist puts it, he and his relatives were the most powerful individuals in Egypt at the end of the 20th dynasty, his activities were not directed against royal interests. Ramsesnacht often attended the distribution of supplies to workmen and controlled much of the activity connected with the construction of the king's tomb, possibly because the treasury of the high priest of Ammonius was now at least partially funding these works. Ramsesnacht's son Yuzermernacht was made into the steward of Ammonius and became administrator of large swaths of land in Middle Egypt. He also inherited the role of Meribast as controller of the country's taxes, ensuring that Ramsesnak's family was in full control of both the royal treasury and the treasury of Ammonius. Further high offices such as those of the second and third priests and of God's father of Ammonius were given to people who entered Ramsesnak's family by marriage. Ramsesnacht was powerful enough to build for himself one of the largest funerary establishments of the entire Theban necropolis at the end of the New Kingdom, when royal building projects including Ramesses VI's usurped mortuary temple had been abandoned. Ramsesnacht's monument, 
in DRA Abu El Naga, reused an earlier building dating back to the 17th or 18th dynasty and was refurbished to show the political and economic standing of its owner. Egypt's political and economic decline continued unabated during Ramesses V.I.'s reign. He is the last king of the New Kingdom period whose name is attested on inscribed wall fragments as well as two pillars of the Temple of Hathor of the Sarabit el Khatham in Sinai, where he sent expeditions to mine copper ore. Egyptian presence in Canaan was terminated during or soon after Ramesses V.I.'s rule, with the last garrisons leaving southern and western Palestine around the time, and the frontier between Egypt and abroad returning to a fortified line joining the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. A 2017 archaeological study reached the same conclusion, namely that Ramesses V.I.'s reign is the terminus post quem for the presence of the Egyptian military in Jaffa, which was twice destroyed around this time period. Opponents of the Egyptian authority were of local extraction, probably originating in Canaanite cities of the Levantine coastal plain, an opposition to Egyptian hegemony ultimately resulting from the arrival of the sea people in the region during the reign of Ramesses III. The loss of all Asiatic territories further strained the redistributive economy of Egypt's New Kingdom society, depriving the subsequent kings of much of their legitimacy. The Egyptian control of Nubia seems to have been much firmer at the time, owing either to the advanced Egyptianization of the local population or to the economic importance of this region. Ramesses V.I.'s cartouches have been uncovered on Sihal Island near Aswan and in Ramesses II's temple in Wadi Esebua. Ramesses VI is mentioned in the tomb of Pene in Anaba, not far from the third cataract of the Nile. Pene also recounts punitive military raids further south, from which he claims to have brought back loot to Pharaoh. Ramesses VI was buried in the Valley of the Kings, in a tomb now known as KV-9. The tomb was first built for Ramesses V, who may have been buried in it for the short period of time necessary for another, likely undecorated tomb, to be cut for him somewhere else in the Valley of Kings and which remains to be discovered. In any case, Ramesses VI commanded that KV-9 be entirely refurbished for himself with no space left for Ramesses V's permanent burial, who was finally led to rest in Ramesses VI's second year on the throne, possibly because stability had returned to Thebes at the time. The usurpation of Ramesses V's tomb may be a sign that Ramesses VI did not hold his predecessor in high regard, which would explain why he had Ramesses V's name obliterated and replaced by his own on more than one occasion. Alternatively it may reflect the king's pragmatic concern for economical measures. The renewed works on KV-9 are responsible for the preservation of the tomb of Tutankhamun, the entrance of which was buried beneath huts built for the craftsmen working on Ramesses V.I.'s tomb. These works seem to have been completed during Ramesses V.I.'s sixth year of reign, at which point Ramesesnacht received 600 devons of blunted copper tools in the great forecourt of Ammonius in Karnak, probably indicating the end of the construction works on the tomb. Furthermore, if the Theban Ostrakhan 1860a does refer to Ramesses VI and not Ramesses X, then it indicates that the tomb was finally ready for the king in his eighth year on the throne, at which point he might have been ill and nearing death. From the majestic statues that adorned his temples to the intricate reliefs that adorned his tomb, every aspect of Ramesses VI's legacy speaks to the enduring brilliance of Egyptian civilization. Ramesses VI was a visionary leader who left an indelible mark on the landscape of Egypt. His contributions to art, religion, and governance continue to inspire awe and admiration to this day. As visitors from around the world flock to these sacred sites, they bear witness to the enduring legacy of Ramesses VI, a pharaoh whose influence transcends the boundaries of time and space. In the quiet solitude of his eternal resting place, Ramesses V.I.'s spirit lives on, enshrined within the hallowed halls of his funerary temple. 
Here, amid the whispers of the desert winds, his memory endures as a beacon of Egypt's enduring greatness. Through the tireless efforts of modern scholarship, we continue to peel back the layers of time, unearthing the treasures of Ramesses' V.I.'s reign and shedding new light on the rich tapestry of Egypt's history. As we bid farewell to the age of pharaohs and dynasties, let us carry forth the legacy of Ramesses VI, a testament to the enduring power of human ambition and ingenuity. For in the sands of Egypt, the story of civilization itself is etched in stone, waiting to be discovered by those who dare to seek its secrets. <laughs>